Welcome to the Coast Podcast. I'm Emily, a virtual assistant agency owner who left Amazon in 2019 to build my dream. And I'm Whitney, a freelance writer and communications consultant who never felt at home in a cube farm. We didn't see many people paving their own ways like we decided to, so we created this podcast to talk to others who were brave enough to pick a different path. Creatives, entrepreneurs, people doing their careers and their lives their way. Join us as we learn from them, get inspired, and show you beautiful paths less traveled. Not every road leads to the coast, but the ones that do come with a great view. Hi everyone and welcome back to the Coast Podcast. My name is Emily Given and I own a virtual assistant agency just outside of Seattle. And I'm Whitney Popa. I own a communications consultancy in Edmonds and we are here to talk to people whose careers, whose lives we admire. We are so excited to be talking to Laura Sullivan today. She is somebody who I stalked on Instagram from the moment I saw her photos and she and her husband who make Sullivan and Sullivan Studios took pictures of my sorority sister's wedding and they had previews within what felt like the hour of um, my sorority sister getting married and they looked like the Kennedys in their photos so it was like this double like really beautiful art of these really beautiful people in Coeur d'Alene and the caption that went along with these photos I was like these are my people I'm gonna start stalking them I got in their dms immediately and we became buddies and then I hired them to do photos of my mini bump with Oliver and we worked really hard to even have a baby so I knew that picking the right person was going to be really important for that and the experience with Tim and Laura was just incredible um and then we became buddies they came over to our house after I had Oliver and made us this like crazy amazing sushi bowls and took over our kitchen and Roz was really stressed out about it but also really grateful and we've had this wild ride together of like parallel lives in a sense and um a lot of connections throughout Seattle and our daughters being born within a day of each other and being in the NICU and sharing book recommendations. So we are so glad to welcome Laura and hear about her life, her career, movable feasts, their retreat that they do in this like beautiful foreign country every year and just get into it with Laura. So welcome back oh my to gosh, Seattle. Thank you. What? <laughs> thank you. That was a really, that was a sweet trip down memory lane. Yeah. I mean, and I, I didn't know that we stressed Roz out that day. So it's tell him I'm so sorry. <laughs> he is stressed when anybody is in the kitchen, even me. So I stay out and it's, uh, mostly served me well. Yeah. That's a beautiful symbiosis. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, thank you for coming. I'm so excited and, to meet you too. So excited about it. Yeah, Emily, and, I feel like we have a lot to talk about. We do. And having you back in our city, I know you um, secretly moved to Chicago, and I'm not going to really address my feelings about that now, but um, <laughs> I thought it would be helpful to start with you guys becoming what is now Sullivan and Sullivan Studios. I know it was a beautiful journey and it started with you being a social worker or almost being a social worker and then a yoga instructor and then feeling like there's more to life. That's my interpretation of it. What is your story? Um, first of all, I love the term a beautiful journey because that makes me feel like my journey has been much like a bachelor contestants where there's like a lot of crying and champagne. (laughs) Um, so yeah, journey. Uh, yeah. So the quick story of my life is that I got into social work, uh, first year out of college and didn't really, I knew that I wanted to 
help the world, but I didn't really have any tangible skills. I don't know that I, I don't know if I ever will get them. Um, so I did social work for 10 years and even to the point of getting my master's degree in it. And I'll never forget during my thesis, writing my thesis time, my professor, my advising professor had me in to present my thesis topics. And I gave her like a hundred topics because I am a Gemini and also during quarantine, I've gotten kind of into like thinking that star signs are interesting. So I'm a Gemini and I feel like I just have all this like wild stuff to present to her. And she just kind of looked down her nose at me and said, wow, you really have pointy butt bones. And I was kind of like, what? And so I left and I wrote my thesis and I realized that like to get a foothold in any career, I just wasn't going to like be able to dr like drill down hard enough to be where my professor was or narrow down my ideas about what I wanted to do with my life. And so I basically got my master's degree and quit within a month. And I got a job, um, just a day job working at the yoga studio that my husband was running just so we could, you know, be together more and hang out. And then I remember so clearly writhing around on the floor of our living room that summer. And I was like, I just don't know what I want to do. Uh, and Tim's like, we'll just tell me what your biggest dream would be. And I was like, well, I just want to be, I think I like opened one eye and I was like, I just want to be a photographer. But I just was scared to even say it to him because I didn't know how to use a camera and I didn't even know, like I felt very isolated in our apartment thinking like, who would even hire us? I don't even know who would be there. And anyway, so that's, and now we're photographers. So that's the story. Yeah, and you would Just never, kidding. Like, we worked really hard. Never so picked we'd... up a camera before. Like you'd never. Well, I did. I, I okay. had a camera that I had purchased to like take, I, I did a South America trip for six months with my friend and we just kind of bopped around. So I had an idea of what photography was like and that I liked it, but I was just taking pictures for myself and then thought, okay, it's time to, I would always like come back and do some social work, save some money and then go travel for a few months again. And that was kind of my MO. And I just always thought, gosh, I'm never going to get a foothold in a career because all I want to do is work to travel and just save up my little piddly social worker salary and then go and come back. So I just didn't feel like I had a foothold in any one place necessarily. So yeah, so working at the yoga studio during the day and then built the photo business by night and then went full time a year later. Cool. Like, so you basically chose this new path because it I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you were like, because you wanted to travel and make a living doing something while you're traveling, right? Like photograph the beautiful places that you're going. Is that kind of what inspired it? Originally? Yeah. And then I thought, oh gosh, I feel like this, something that sounds really hard and scary would be photographing weddings. And then, so we just, uh, I remember our first wedding we ever shot was my, my fellow social workers wedding. And I was like, I'll shoot the wedding it's our first one. Don't have any expectations. And I'll trade you for this. It was like a really, it was like a $1,500 lens, which at the time we were like, we'll never be able to afford that. So let's just trade a whole wedding for it. And so then it was kind of like grew from there. So I feel like it was like a fun way to meet more people and be with them on their really vulnerable moments and their happiest moments, but also kind of help them through some of the big life moments. So I feel like social work has still spoken to a lot of things that we do, um, even if it's yeah. not direct. That's a really good correlation. I would have never thought about that, but that's so true. You're helping people like get through exciting times and tough times. And yeah, it's really intimate. Exciting. I think to have right. your photo exciting. taken most exciting. Right. Yeah. But it's like, I, I still am surprised by every shoot that I do. It's like people go through divorces or have struggles with their kids or their jobs. And it's like, you're never just taking photos. You're always kind of being with the person wherever they are. And I think that's one of the things I like most about it is that I still get to be very intimate with people um, while we're creating art together. So how long has it been since you started, you know, you've been with your business full time? Um, six years. And then when did your husband join? We had promised ourselves a honeymoon, but we didn't have, because I had so much grad school debt, we just had to pay it off. So three years after we got married, we paid off the social work debt and then bought a one-way ticket to Asia. 
And so while we were there, we had had maybe like four weddings under our belt, but we spent some really focused time on our honeymoon, writing a website, designing a website, and then booking new clients for the next year. And so I feel like that was when we joined forces and then quit. Our, we'd quit our jobs to leave Seattle and then started the business from Thailand and then came back to work a year or so later. So yeah, 2015, we kind of started off, like we did it together. That's so fascinating. What a fun honeymoon. Like It was. I don't feel like I'm designed for like lounging on the beach. <laughs> I mean, maybe for a couple of minutes I could do it, but I don't think that my personality is very well suited to, um, I mean, you could also say that I have some anxiety, <laughs> but like I'm not very well suited just to relaxing. So I feel like unless we have a project, at least somewhere in our radar that it's so it was my dream honeymoon to travel and work at the same time I relate to that so hard <laughs> like I'm that person that gets a massage and I'm like thinking about four, 42 things in my head at the same time I can't relax so I get that I know it's not <laughs> it's not um I'm definitely working on it but also I feel like the pointy butt bones thing is like I'm like, this is just my personality. I don't know. And so how do you, how do you yeah, kind of, um, mean pointy butt bones? Like, she meant okay. that I just can't sit still. And she meant that I can't sit still long enough to focus on a, like a one idea. And I was so hurt by it, but I really do feel like it was good wisdom because I think all of us have these things about our personalities that were, we feel like our weaknesses maybe, or things we need to be working on. But then usually those things are the ones that add up to being the reason that we're able to do what we're doing. That's different. And so I think that kind of accepting there obviously always be changing and always be growing, but I also feel like, oh my gosh, I think being in your thirties is like the greatest thing in the world because there's so many things that you can start accepting about yourself and then using it for leverage as opposed to being embarrassed about it. Mm -hmm. And my, I'm not diagnosed ADD, but I definitely feel like I have elements of just like ugh, shiny syndrome at times. And I feel like that's, it's fine that's kind of helped us build and be nimble. Yeah. And I think that's an important point too. And something that I've actually been thinking about and embracing for myself. I'm in the middle of David Chang's book, um, eat a peach. And it's kind of memoir and kind of like an exploration of like his mental health battles. And he was talking about how like workaholism is one of the only holic isms that is accepted in society right now because people are like you know that's all a disease like this is clearly a disease but like oh you work hard you know and mm -hmm. I think there's like there's a few things to unpack there like there's value in in loving what you do enough that it doesn't feel like work that like going on a vacation to take photos for work feels great and you feel filled mm -hmm. up and you get that refreshing however you need to be refueled like there's definitely I I think about and work all the time and I don't often feel depleted unless it's something that's not lighting me up and I've gotten better at like these are the opportunities that light me up and this is what I'm going to say no to so that my energy is always up so and I also think there's like you know, who's defining workaholism and workaholism, workaholicism? Um, and like, what does that even mean to people? You know, like, mm -hmm. I think to your point about being in your thirties, it's so important to take a step back and, and I know that for myself, I've absorbed so much more into my body of, um, expectations of the world than I thought I had. And undoing that has been such a huge process for me. Like when we're swapping book recs and you see like, I, I'm like reading all about trauma, um, how to, you know, like write a story brand, how to, um, get out of your own way, like reading stories of other people who have worked differently. And, um, like you said, learning to accept these things about ourselves, like the fact that I want to work all the time on things that I love doing isn't a bad thing if it's not taking away from other things that I love. So I was curious for you, when you went to that first wedding, were you like, I am in this, this is exactly how I wanted to feel, like versus being a social worker and probably feeling a little bit like dragged down or 
like heavy did you feel like the lightness of like okay this is actually what like I wanted to do and my body told me I had wanted to do yes that is such a great question and I think it's such a good point that our bodies tell us what we really think about something and I just was so energized and so pumped that day like that was one of my hard I was so nervous and it was one of my most I think that nerves when you're trying something new cause a form of attention that you don't often give to things that are more rote and I remember just being so tired and so happy and just feeling exactly like what you're saying. Like, this is so amazing. And I think along those same lines, I all, along with the workaholism thing, I also hear a lot of talk about creating work-life balance. And I feel the same way about that as you do about workaholism in certain ways where it's like people would say, oh, you're starting a business with your husband. Like, make sure that you like have date nights to not talk about the business. And we were like, we don't know what that means because the business is not this like, it's not purely about money. So it's not like we're just, you know, barreling through just to get like a certain paycheck. It's an offering of our lives together. And so to not talk, we actually did try at the very beginning. We were like, let's try to not talk about it at the dinner table. And then we were like, we didn't even have kids yet. So like now obviously we just talk about the kids too, the kid, but um, we were like, that doesn't make like the work life balance thing doesn't make sense to me unless you really feel like you need a break from your work, which we, if we're balancing things right, don't. Yeah. And I, um, I was thinking about that a lot lately too. I needed work-life balance when I had a corporate job because I was like, Mm -hmm. they're paying me for these hours and now I'm done and I'm taking my vacation and that's it. I was very clear about my boundaries because I needed them. Whereas now, like if I'm on the massage table, having an idea of like, Oh, um, I help Emily with her PR. I'm like, I want to pitch Emily to this place. And now I have to like you know, make that mental note to walk out of here and like put a, you know, calendar reminder for me to reach out to that person. Like that's exciting for me. Mm -hmm. Like my brain isn't going to shut off just because Mm -hmm. I'm having a massage and the the ability of my business to just allow me to have a massage in the middle of the day is really special to me. Yeah. For me, setting that work-life balance boundary, it means it doesn't mean that you're not thinking about your business because that's like where you're expanding and growing and just dreaming about you and your, your baby essentially. But for me, it's like, I don't answer client emails after five o'clock. Right. So it's like, I set that hard boundary. Um, and I don't set answer client emails on the weekend for instance, but I'll still like work on, website update or you know think about trainings that I want to do for my assistants or things like that so I guess it's like a different kind of boundary and Mm -hmm. it and it feels like that's enough for me yeah I think that's good wisdom too just kind of I think that creating boundaries for your clients to operate within is a gift to them I'm a big proponent of not especially for people more coaching new business owners um not just bending over backwards because you feel like you won't get the client otherwise, or it's like people like to have a a space to operate within and they thrive within that. So create that for them and for yourself. When you think about your business, are you thinking of it as beyond the photos? Because I think of it as beyond the photos, like the writing, like are you coaching people on writing because you're amazing at it? Thank you. And yes, we are. And that's something that's been on my mind about, um, I don't advertise that, but we, a lot of our side business is copywriting coaching. Thanks for the compliment. (sighs) Well, yeah. I mean, there are very few captions I read in totality and all of them are yours. I'm a writer. I DM them to Roz. I mean, you're a writer too. I've just had to tell myself and the world that I'm a writer in order to get more business writing. You have to just own Um, it at a certain point. Yeah. And I feel like it makes me so happy to uh, let people clue into how their writing can affect their business. And so that's been a big thing for us is copywriting coaching. And we actually filmed an entire course during COVID and never released it. (laughs) I remember seeing that. Oh, I got to get on it. I know. It's like, yeah. Full disclosure. Have you already done the work filming? I know. And editing and getting the transcripts. Um, I will be a full, like full disclosure. I feel like 
a bit of a fraud right now talking to you both because it's been a very anxiety ridden week and I feel like post the end of not I know we're not out of COVID but the way that 2020 shook out and the way it's kind of like seeping into 2021 in terms of we have a double book summer because it's two summers in one and everyone's like oh my gosh how great you have so many like that's so great I'm like it's it's never how I would have designed a summer if I had had control over it. So I feel like I'm up at two in the morning feeling stressed. And I had a nightmare last night, the movable feast. We're going to France this year for movable feast. And I had a nightmare about um, everyone getting stuck in the airport in New York. So I feel like there's just so much um, stress and I don't feel, I don't know how to necessarily say a good way to handle it this week and I'm not feeling my most powerful self. So I think I would also just like to note that because I think there are just some weeks where you're like, have you guys read big magic by Elizabeth Gilbert? She yes. talks about <laughs> the idea of a shit sandwich. <laughs> and <everything>. the sh <laughs> it's one of my favorite things from that book is, uh, there's a lot that I love about that book, but, um, choosing any path, you have to also choose the sh shit sandwich. And so I feel like things can look really beautiful from the outside, but then there's also something that's the trade-off. And so I feel right now like the shit sandwich is just like an immense amount of pressure and stress that I don't know how to compartmentalize <laughs> as things are kind of opening back up, but maybe not opening back up. And I think it's just so hard on small business owners. So I feel like my encouragement to people would be just to kind of keep putting your head down and keep going because it's a hard time but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it it's just a hard time and I'm yeah it's just a lot right now yeah this episode brought the moral to you of this by story. CBD yeah I don't know <laughs> the moral of the story is authenticity and yeah we don't it's a have hard... to always have it together or feel like like we're it's okay to feel anxious yeah, I certainly don't feel like I have it together this week. I also feel like uh, Tim and I are reaching our max with being in a house with a toddler all day, every day. Like, we haven't actually done childcare yet. And so I think that's another thing that I feel like I spend all day taking care of a two-year-old or Tim does and I get a little stuff done. And then all at night, my brain is like, and then this and this and this. And it's just, yeah, crazy times. Yeah. It took me with our son. I was running my business from home and working probably more hours than I was in the office. And my husband was commuting to Amazon. This was when like, you guys had come over. And it took me 17 months until I was able to loosen the grip at all and allow myself the delegation of childcare. And even now, I struggle with how much child care I want to outsource because that's part of like why I created my business so that I could be with my family more so then like what mm -hmm. kind of mom am I if I'm outsourcing these kids so that I can do more work because like back to my earlier point the kids they usually don't light me up you know like it's so much work it's so much poop it's so much whining um and as much as I love them and think they're magical little creatures I like have my own goals too so like I don't think it's ever going to be like a balanced conversation but like for me because it's just a very tough life place but I can 10,000 percent relate and um we found a great nanny on care.com multiple times so and you guys have tons of resources every time you ask on Instagram because everybody's there reading your captions I they feel come so through. lucky about our Instagram community. They saved our complete asses this year. Um, yeah, no, she's starting school. Misa's starting school first week of September, and I feel so excited to have a little bit of breathing room to build the things that are on my mind. Yeah, and that will be back in Chicago. <laughs> yes. Yes, wit. I hear that. I hear that tone. <laughs> 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 well, I'm just curious, yeah. you know, where she's going to start school, you know? Yeah. Like, they still haven't had a play date. They're one day apart, Misa said and that to Tim. Um, Bianca. I said that to Tim this morning. I was like, man, I can't believe the girls still haven't spent time together when they were just a room away in the hospital. Yeah. They were one room away. And That's a... Well, they were in the NICU at the same time. Ooh. 
Because weren't you there for... Yeah. Two days? We three. we were there for three days. So um, our situation was much less intense than yours. Still traumatizing, but not... I mean, how do you even measure trauma? Anyway, um, uh-huh. Bianca was born and inhaled fluid on the way out so she had to get her lungs dried out for three days and we were in the NICU but we like kept graduating to different rooms so um I think we were in like the first like I don't know scariest NICU um and then like there a day and then you guys came there when we moved out to like the intermediate I don't know almost ready to be released NICU and um I remember feeling really weird walking to Tavolata, which is our favorite restaurant on Capitol Hill, um, and feeling like, wow, we have really expensive babysitting for us to just, (laughs) like, I just gave birth, I put a hoodie on over a dress, and we walked down the hill to have pasta, and had a glass of champagne because we were kind of celebrating like it was just the most bizarre and then we went to find snacks for you guys because I hadn't heard from you and I was like I will never forget it I I had a feeling yeah oh gosh don't start crying because I'm gonna also weep I'm (laughs) crying every day also these days so (laughs) yeah I'll never forget it you brought me Cheetos in a people magazine and I was like (laughs) I always felt like you all were um such examples for us and steps ahead of us and the fact that you were even a day ahead of us in the NICU I was like they thought to bring us snacks like I couldn't believe how thoughtful you were when B was still in there too just meant so much like those little things mean so much and it I don't know well yeah Yeah, I I think that I mean we all three know that that's such a fraught I feel like I kind of had the world figured out and I was um just confident that like you can bring the life about that you want if you just kind of do certain things and a lot of that is white privilege and a lot of that is like being being born into a situation that has made my life much easier than most but then having a Mesa die and just having the rug completely ripped out and being like oh I actually don't have control of anything and I feel like that was one of, it was the most life-changing thing that I've ever experienced. And I think that vulnerability that you're talking about, that feeling of just like you're floating through the world, you're going to get dinner and you look normal to the people at the restaurant. Like I had the same feeling at Bar Melozine. I was like, here we are having an oyster and like my world is crashing around me and I don't know what to say to the waiter because I'm like a human in the world. Um, Yeah, it's humbling and I would love I'm really into birth stories would you would you tell us like what or tell the listener or do you feel comfortable do you yeah I just am wondering if I can get through without crying because Whitney kind of tearing up makes me kind of tear up Hmm. um yeah (laughs) um I felt so confident throughout my pregnancy that I, had, I feel like I had a good conversation with my daughter throughout the pregnancy that she was telling me that she was good. And so we did a lot of um, really bold first pregnancy things. Like we did a baby moon in Nepal and went to the Himalayas and spent a month in Thailand. And I just ate street food and just lived my normal life. And I felt like I had such a good conversation with her. And so when we went into my water broke and we went in to give birth, I felt like, okay, this is going to be so great. We're going to be out by dinner time and our little buddy's going to be here. And, um, basically she got stuck and I had to go the short story. I mean, obviously every birth story, it's like, there's so many details you could go by second by second. I didn't know that before I had a baby, how every second just feels so important in a birth story. It's like, you could just probably sit for hours and retell it, but she got stuck. And I started hemorrhaging, and so I went into an emergency C-section, and she was um, totally silent. And I remember the nurses holding her up across um, the operating room, and her, her, wow, we made eye contact, and I just thought, like, that, I don't, I don't know that person. Like, I felt like a stranger to her when I first saw her, because the circumstances were so different than what I thought and so she went without oxygen and had 
brain damage. And so basically nobody would tell us if she would even survive. We were just kind of, you know, begging everyone for answers. And all they said was she's in the best possible hands, which was true. I feel so grateful for Swedish First Hill because they saved her. So, yeah, I think, I mean, relatively speaking, she was, it was a short time in the NICU. She was only there for two weeks, but we just were, you know, with a neurologist every day and she was doing MRIs and just trying to figure out like, will she walk? Will she talk? Will she love? Um, and I just think the dark, the dark place you go to when you think my life was going this way. And it could very well be the opposite. Like Tim and I had long nights of just saying, we've had such a good run. And if we, gosh, sorry, if we have to care for a child who cannot, who will not have like the life that we thought for her, then we have been more than blessed with what we've been able to experience with life. But we kind of said goodbye to the idea of having the same life again, because we didn't know that she would be able to do anything. And so I think that it just shaped my experience as a parent so much because the little frustrations that I probably would have had, I just feel such a celebration where it's like, she's talking and she like, she's perfectly fine. And I just, we're just not over it. Like, I don't, I don't know that we'll ever get over it, that she's thriving. Um, wow. Thanks for asking. It was a lot, but I, I feel like it was just so life changing because my gratitude for her and my gratitude for every annoying thing that she does <laughs> is so next level because like, I didn't know, I didn't know that we wouldn't have it. Well, um, <laughs> let me compose myself for a second. Um, I can tell you that nobody's birth story has made me cry like that before. And I relate to you so hard. I know, I feel um, like we have a lot to I'm not, not saying that this about me, and we should catch up later, but my son also did not breathe for six minutes and had full body cooling in the NICU at Seattle Children's. So <sighs> we do have a lot the cooling. to talk about. I know, I saw your story, and I still, I teared up just even reading your story before I knew that you were the co-host, and I just feel like the HIE parents and the cooling, like, who knew about the cooling pad? And like, I, do you, do you think about the cooling pad every day? Because I think about the cooling pad every day (laughs) and like how much it changed our lives. Um, yeah, I just, I think there was also a really interesting mix of, um, feeling, I don't, I don't necessarily know where I land with religion or spirituality. I think I'm working through a lot of things that I grew up with with that, but I definitely know that, um, with a mix of the best Western medicine and having so much spiritual force going towards our daughter. I just feel like I'll, I'll never just speak confidently about one thing or another because I feel so grateful for all of the prayers and energy and thoughts that I definitely feel like welcoming a baby to a world with so much love, um, humbled me also because I definitely think she felt it and I'm sure you had a similar experience. Before that experience, I didn't really know what I thought about prayer because, like you said, I'm not, I'm not religious. Um, but like, like, just like you said, prayer is energy and, and positive energy is like, it really helped me. I really believe it now. Like I, yeah, I really do. Yeah. Same. It's a complete game changer when you're really down and, and need it. Um, the other book that I'd really recommend is, uh, help. Thanks Wow by Anne Lamott. And that was the first book we read to her in the NICU. And it was just kind of like those prayers that you pray when you don't even know what you think about prayer. But this is like your soul crying for something. Um, So that's one of my favorite books. She's incredible. She was just on Tim Ferriss's podcast. And I shared that on my Instagram. Yeah. And it was like a two hour conversation so funny you bring her up because I asked my mom my mom asked what I wanted for my birthday which is on Sunday and I said um I want this like gooseneck for my microphone because I can't like I hate holding it and it's annoying and um bird by bird by Anne Lamont which is about writing 
Um, and I've had that on my Amazon wish list forever. And she, listening to her speak, she is religious, but also deeply spiritual. So she's like the mm-hmm. perfect human and, you know, a recovering addict and all sorts of beautiful, amazing contradictions, um, in a person worth loving deeply. Um, and I, I really love her approach. It's a little too religious for me. I've actually, if you ever look up um, humanism, that's what I think I am. I've been on this spiritual um, crisis journey awakening thing as well. And I, I've read a little bit about humanism and I'm like, oh, that's what I am. Okay, I'm going to look into it. I don't, I know the term, but I don't know a lot about it. Yeah, it's like kind of just taking it it reminds me of Misa's story because it's like you have all these people from all around the world who come from different faiths who are bringing that energy to you even just through this virtual platform um and it's all about taking what you need from different faiths and really like kind of like um Glennon says like I love humanity but I don't like humans it's kind of like that (laughs) that sounds that sounds accurate Yeah. And it's like, for me too, like I have, we don't have to get into religion because none of my family members will ever listen to this if we do, but, and I don't know that I care. Um, but you know, like Jesus was Brown and Jesus was hugely liberal and Jesus hung out with the lepers. So there's like, if you're telling me you love Jesus, then you intuitively would believe some similar things to how he lived his life and the hypocrisy there is so deeply triggering for me um that organized religion doesn't resonate with me at all but like different and I've felt my whole life like you need to do this you need to believe in Christianity in the way that we do um and I've always defined myself so differently that I felt like in so many ways very outside and um I remember seeing you guys asking for those prayers from all these people from around the world and it just really resonated with me of like it doesn't matter how you define it as long as you have some kind of relationship or basis in faith that gets you through things and who are we to judge each other for how that is articulated unless it's deeply hypocritical then I have issues with it or it disenfranchises people um that's my other main huge beef with it But, um, you know, at the end of the day, like what is so deeply resonant for me about you guys is how you live. Like I've been trying to describe it in my head, like just like on the surface, like you wear it, you wear who you are, you wear how you feel about the world you share, um, in a way that's like so deeply vulnerable, but still like, you know, what you choose to share. And I think so many people are afraid of sharing who they really are, um, that it resonates because they feel like they know you, um, and that they can be safe with you. Thank you. That is, that is the highest compliment I feel like we could possibly get. I just want everyone to feel really safe with us because they are. And in terms of photography, like, I'm going to get into one of my, like, big unnecessary opinions about things, but, like, I, Ooh, I have a it. bunch of clients That's... who, <laughs> they are gall getting branding photos now, and they all feel awkward. Like, you guys, that's one of your big things. Like, you say, you can be, um, you can look great in photos, we promise. That's, like, your mantra. And all of these really beautiful clients of mine are so like new to branding photos afraid of things they're carrying their insecurities with them wherever they go and Mm -hmm. a couple a couple of them just did their first set of branding photos ever and they have these huge social followings but they they're very hesitant to put their actual faces out there because their LDS and all of these women that they're surrounded by in their space are beautiful skinny blonde you know botoxed and have 10 kids trailing them everywhere and that's just not what their lives look like they're a little bit messier a little more real um and they did their branding shoot last week and all I could think of was you guys and Andrea because um what you do in your shoots is unlike anybody else in terms of like 
bringing who your whole selves there and like your stories and connecting with your clients like you're bringing in aligned clients to begin with because you're saying this is who I am all the time and then you're with them on that journey you're fixing their hair you're telling them they like you know move that way um if they if they need to you're showing them the back of the camera so that they can feel comfortable along the way and I find that that is like the biggest differentiator between like a really great photographer and an okay slash good photographer and I've had plenty of experiences myself but like walking out of there feeling good is such a gift to people um aside from the memories aside from all the like output of that most people if they're not with a good photographer they're terrified waiting for those photos however long it takes and my experience with you guys and what I hope that every client of yours has with you guys is they know that they feel buzzy like great from the energy that you guys bring to them and empowering them and lifting them up and showing them that they look amazing and I just it's not really a question so much as like my personal beef of like hearing my clients be like yeah, we don't know how it went and we didn't feel very good about it. And it's such an investment and it's such a vulnerable thing that it just makes me so sad. Um, and it makes me so happy to know you. Thank you. That was such a kind thing to say. That's so encouraging. Yeah. this is me just like complimenting you the whole time. Um, but I wonder if you can like, is that, Oh, I was just going to ask, like, is that something that like, is top of mind for you guys are you thinking of like we want to make sure that people know we'll fix their hair that's a big thing for me yeah I think that with getting your photo taken which is so vulnerable especially if you're getting it taken for something like your brand which is also so vulnerable um the memory that you have of getting your photo taken is almost as important to you as the photo because how you felt in that moment will translate through to the picture. And so I feel like creating really welcoming. I think that the core of both of our brands is hospitality and in everything that we create or do, we have hospitality top of mind. Um, I think that often when you are building a business, especially one like photography where your work is just so front and center, your own insecurities, like if you're a new photographer and you're like, in your own head or it feeling insecure about what you're creating, the client's going to read that as not them not being good enough. So I think really quickly I, I learned that like, if I'm too in my own head about what I'm creating, then it's going to read as cold. And so it's, I don't know. I think that, that most businesses are an active service. And so focusing on client first and then yourself far, far after that is valuable for any industry where it's like you're off, you're giving an offering to your clients. So make it about them. (laughs) It's not about you or how you feel that day or whatever it may be. And I just, I know that you guys do such a good job of that. And I'm hoping that like when you send people there, like you hired us, here's what you're going to get that like you make sure they know that like we got you when it comes to hair like they know that but also like writing it out and being like we'll bring some hairspray if you want to like we are your hype people thank you we're in the midst of rewriting our website so thank you for these reminders of copy that we should include (laughs) yeah and read that story brand book I thought you had recommended it I did no no I got it from you and then I read it and I read we revamped our entire movable feast website in a weekend after reading it so that was a good tip from you Oh, good. And then sold out in 36 hours. So it's like, thank you, Wit. Thank you, yes. Don Miller. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, yeah, I feel like we actually got an email last night from somebody who we'd never worked with and who lives in Thailand. And they said, I noticed that you used on your Movable Feast website the word Sherpa. And I just, it was like the kindest email. And I actually haven't responded yet because I was getting ready for today. But I just felt so honored that somebody across the world thought enough of us to send us an email saying, could you consider maybe using a different word? Um, So I feel like copy, that's part of like copy is so important and words are so important. And I think that having the space to create a brand where it's like, I want our clients to know that I really welcome feedback, even if it's not positive. And so we changed it and I'm going to respond like with just so much gratitude, but um, 
along the same lines of client service, just being really open to growth and whatever that may look like. And if you're, this isn't really on topic to what you were just talking about, but it's top of mind for me is, especially after this long year of kind of strange energy, just being really open to conversations with your clients, even if, like if somebody's taking the time to email you from across the world with thoughts on your brand, then that's an honor. (laughs) And like, we are in the wrong in this case. And it's an honor to be called in like that. So yeah, I feel like the conversation with clients for any business is just so important. Yeah. And I'm working on being better about that. I actually have trained myself to be less responsive where like, let's say I get feedback like that and my, the words that I use and put together, like they matter so much to me. I got some shitty feedback on a freelancing site that I wrote a run-on sentence and I was like of all the things that this person said it was like the most offensive part because I was like I do not write run-on sentences and um in that case I had to choose to not move forward with the project because it was draining me and um, this person was not kind but generally I would sit with that and then respond versus react to it um and I so I think that you taking that time you know whether you came at it with an attitude like I did or not which it sounds like you didn't um is super positive because you're giving them that space to say their piece and um be heard and at the end of the day humans just want to be heard yeah this person was also very kind so it was easier for me to (laughs) react like that yeah, uh, I'm also reactive. Sure. So I think it's hard not to be, especially this year. Like I just we talked to um one of our friends a couple weeks ago who's a makeup artist and she said that her business kind of exploded during COVID. Um because people were eloping, they were doing things on the fly and an interesting thing that she mentioned was that the emails that she's getting now for inquiries are just so kind of curt and like, Hey, $200 at this hotel at, you know, 6am be there basically. And I was like, wow, I hadn't even thought about that. Like people are just removing all pleasantries at this point. Like they've never met you. They're just saying like, give me this service for this amount of money. Have you experienced that? Not at all. In fact, we've gone the opposite way. And I kind of thought that we might like people might get a little squirrely like that post COVID, but I feel like people have been more in depth and more kind and more excited to create a real relationship than they ever were before. Um, So I don't know what that is about, but I also feel like one of my big things with copywriting coaching, and I don't know who that guest was and I would love to look at their, their stuff because I, I always say that if there's like a consistent thing, a consistent problem that you're having with clients or with inquiries, what are you doing to invite that? I'm not saying this about this person because I don't know. I don't know anything about their story, so I don't want her to feel like <laughs> I'm calling her out. But like in general, it's like if you're having a consistent issue with clients, what are you doing to invite that behavior or that the way they treat you? Because you're putting something out there that says, well, it's okay. Obviously, there's like one-off clients all the time, but I feel like pretty proud that we get consistently in-depth, kind, generous clients because I hope that that's what we're putting out that we would like to give to them um, and that it weeds through the people who are just like curt or unkind. Yeah. It's a bigger investment with you guys too, whereas somebody wants their makeup done, they're like, here's my $200, show up. Yeah, it's like they can do much Maybe. more bulk clients. It's Every brand is different, but I also feel like you get out in certain ways. You get out what you're putting out. What's the, what, what phrase am I trying to say? You get back what you're putting out in certain ways. So if there's consistent, consistently something happening in your business or your life that you're like, oh, that's not ideal. You can usually trace. I can usually, if, I, if you send me your stuff, trace it back to something that, like one sentence or – one idea on your website that you're not nailing with what you want to come across with your brand. It's a really great point. And I hadn't thought about that either. It's, it goes back to the Don Miller book. Yeah. I have to read this book. You do. It's so good. Well, and I also feel like Whitney, you and I read a lot about 
branding. It's not like we're just recommending the first branding book that crossed our path. Like it was exceptional. So do you have a few minutes for our rapid fire questions that aren't really yes. very rapid at all? Okay, here we go. I forgot to review them, so I hope that I'm oh. ready. Do you, what's your favorite coffee order? My favorite coffee order is so bougie and I'm embarrassed. I whisper it because it's a triple oh my God, I love it. oat milk latte. Mm. I don't think that's bougie. Well, I just feel like oat milk is, is like, bougie? oh, I don't know. I drink oat milk. It just feels like a yeah, really we actually expensive... had a long conversation about oat milk. I think it's so good. I just feel like it's a really expensive drink, so I always am like, it's a triple, please, thank you. Yeah, but Chicago and Seattle, they're amenable to it. Like, you might have a problem somewhere like Texas. I don't know. Outside of Austin. Yeah, I'm good not point. an expert. I hate when people say that, too. Um, what is your first happy memory? Oh my gosh, what a sweet question. I feel like my first happy memory is that my sister and I used to play naked on our front driveway and with like sidewalk chalk and we would just run around screaming together and her being my buddy was my first joy. Aww. She's still my best friend. What clothing item would you wear every day if you could? Mm. I have a Mara Hoffman dress. It's like a sack that I got at Glasswing in Seattle, and I would wear it every single day. And I almost have for like five years. I love that. A lot of people say that they would wear a dress every day. For me, it's like straight up soft pants. But like, I get that. It's a similar feeling on your body of like yeah like nothing's touching my skin yeah that's the goal I also don't know about clothes after COVID I'm like what do humans put on their physical forms how do we do this (laughs) I I actually just did the rent the runway uh, monthly rental because (gasps) did you yeah I'm doing I'm trying to be more sustainable generally um but like hashtag consumerism is hard to quit and so I've been like slowly moving that way and because all I buy are like expensive t-shirts sweatshirts sweatpants because that's all I wear when I feel like oh I kind of want to show up as like a business Whitney then I get so tired of the business Whitney things I have so there's no point in owning them I might as well just be excited about I did the the lowest level like four pieces you can keep them as long as you want you can swap out like once or twice a month for like $70. So uh, this episode brought to you by Rent the, the Runway. Uh. Thank you for that hot tip because I've been thinking about what to do for Movable Feast this year because it's kind of like a style, like you're, it's supposed to be fun, but then also it stresses me out to try to buy all new clothes for it because I don't want to feel like I'm wearing a costume, but it's like right. a next level travel thing. So I'm going to look into it. Yeah. And also like, I know that we can relate on like postpartum body. Like I finally feel like Um, I hate to jinx myself, but now my husband has a vasectomy. (laughs) So, uh, like when I first felt like I was getting my body back, I got pregnant again. And now I'm getting my body back and feeling comfortable in my skin. And I kind of want clothes that reflect that a little bit, but I don't, I feel like it's going to continue to change. So, Mm -hmm. and my vibe and my style, I don't know what that is anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, like you said, so buying things and making an expensive investment doesn't, totally feel right so you feel right yeah I got my first shipment yesterday and there's a couple things that I was really excited about so you should check it out I got some good advice I did an IG live from um my friend Colton's store Q uniform on Capitol Hill because I was like please help me I don't know what to wear and he's like a a stylist and he does he kind of like recycles designer clothes so that you can have a sustainable wardrobe that's still high-end and he gave me a really good piece of advice, mm. which was if you're as you're rebuilding your wardrobe or trying to like come up with a new vibe after all the life changes of the last two years, write down three words that you feel like you really want to reflect in your life and your wardrobe and then kind of narrow your wardrobe from there. Because I was like, I just want to find a really good white T-shirt. And he's like, OK, but what are you trying to 
like portray with your life. And I just thought it was really, it seems kind of simple and silly, but it was really helpful for me to think I'm not in an era of crazy flashy fashion because yeah, I have a toddler who ripped my like one designer dress (laughs) and I was like, okay, I can't be wearing this anymore. So it's, it's kind of like different eras can have different words. And I found that really helpful. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. And it can evolve with you too. Like, who are you this Mm -hmm. year? Who are you today? Um, That can change. Yeah. What is the best business purchase you've made in the last six months under a hundred dollars? I think the best thing that I've, this is like fudging the price a little bit, but, um, I started paying our friend to do some of our editing for us because I was so overwhelmed. And so buying my time back for 30 bucks an hour for editing felt like a really good move for my sanity this summer, which was teetering. You kind of like a VA service. Emily's language. Yeah, I was going to say, it's almost like somebody exactly. here solved that problem. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's something that I had, at first I had like a block around, I hired one of Emily's VAs too, um, to do a lot of that kind of stuff where I was just like, I hate this part. And Mm -hmm. she's like, she had to keep reminding me for over a year of like, these are things that my people do. My people can do anything. And I'm like, that felt too cheesecake factory to me. Like I didn't know, like there's too much to pick from. But then I started being like, okay, I hate doing this so this person can do this thing and then I'll like wake up like you in the middle of the night like oh I can ask her to do this thing and then I'll send like a frantic email of like with no deadline and not my real self because I'm so disorganized with it but Mm -hmm. now that I'm getting in more of a flow I can be like oh can she do this thing too and um it's empowering so I am with you I think buying your time back is one of the hardest things to move into as a small business owner. And that's why I do think that a VA service is so important because there are so many things that like your time is not best used doing and you're actually wasting money to not hire that that person. That's what I tell everybody. (laughs) (laughs) This is a book that actually directly helps Emily too, but if you haven't read it, please read Do Less by Kate Northup. Um, have you read that one? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. That one really pushed me over the edge to hiring Emily and buying my time back and giving myself permission. Like we could talk for hours about like how women over extend ourselves because we feel like we should, or we have to, or all those words that we shouldn't even have in our vocabulary about being a woman. Um, but it really pushed me over the edge. I'm listening to her financial book and I don't love audiobooks I just don't love listening to people talk through their books yeah Um, I want it I want them to be a podcast I don't want it to be a book reading yeah it sounds so cheesy to me I'm like trying to do audible and I just can't um last question is what is lighting you up lately um the what is lighting me up lately I don't want to feel like I'm wishing my life away but the summer has been so chaotic that the thing that's getting me through is the idea Tim and I had a tradition before Misa of spending a month abroad every year as like a way to say we want the life that like we're creating the life that we want and this is what we want. Um, and I think we're going to try to do it again this year in Oaxaca in January. So my, what's lighting me up is the idea of finishing this crazy year and then spending a month abroad. Have you heard that stat that like, people get more it's almost like the looking forward is equally or more exciting than actually being there like I think about that all the time I do too you have to have that glimmer of like hope in your days and that's half the value of a trip (laughs) yeah and we're also revamping our house and I feel like that I'm looking forward to seeing that come to life because it's been a dream of mine for a long time to do a full reno and so I feel like that's another thing that I'm looking forward to getting back to Chicago to doing. And I'm going to butcher this, but like you guys have like the Chicago equivalent of like a brownstone. What is it called? Like a row house, a brownstone. I'm going to, I forget what it's called in Chicago, but it's a brown, it's basically a a brownstone and I'm obsessed with how it, with how it looks. Like I just think that architectural style is so cool. And I can't believe 
that we have one. I'm like in shock. You manifested it and I 10,000% believe that for you and your life and how you move through it so intuitively. Thank you, Wit. Um, do you have anything that you want to plug that you want us to tell people about? Movable Feast is sold out. So are you going to tease them with where you want to go next year? What that do you want is people to so know? TBD. Um, I, what do I want people to know about what we're doing next? What I would love to just say out loud is that as we move away from more weddings and into more branding work is that if you have a copywriting issue or a web design issue or making your brand kind of fit together, I want to be a one-stop shop for people who are starting a business and want to do it with heart and soul and have all of their branding and copywriting speak to each other. So we're revamping our website to reflect that, but that is the biggest thing that I would love for people to call us about. If you have questions about your copy or if you want coaching or um, you want visuals that speak to what you're creating with your brand. So Sullivan and Sullivan studios.com is our website. And Sullivan Sullivan studios on Instagram as well. And everybody should call you because you guys seriously have one of the few captions I read every single time. You post. <laughs> I feel like I've lost my spark uh, post COVID. So thank you for this <laughs> encouragement. I was looking back over past writing and I was like, I used to be so fun. I'm so weary. Sometimes when you don't have the energy though, you don't overthink it. Like the one that you just had out of like, please don't call me though. I don't like to talk on the phone. I was like, <laughs> you know what? Facts. Like, I don't. I just want to see your face. No lies. Just FaceTime me. Thank you again so much for your time. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. This episode's music was provided by Sloan Best. And editing provided by Kayla Shoup.